What do you think of when you hear this phrase, health challenges in a tropical, low-income country? I imagine many of you are thinking of infectious disease, perhaps vector-borne diseases and the challenges of controlling them in this kind of a setting. Or you might think about access to water. And again, infectious diseases, all the nasty critters that are um, in water sources in environments like this. Uh, you might also think about access to safe and reliable food, um, again related to infectious disease, but also uh, because this would promote health. Uh, well, increasingly in the last 15 years or so, the global health community has shown we should also be very concerned about access to clean air, not just water and food. Um, and in fact, you can see that perhaps on this slide with some of the smoke rising from this village. Um, this is the village of Mondena uh, in Madagascar where we're doing our research. And we can zoom in uh, to see some of the sources of this smoke. Um, for example, cooking fires, uh, burning wood typically in this village rather than charcoal, huge amounts of smoke. Uh, this is something that affects the lives especially of women and children uh, who are often around the cooking fires, right? We also have a huge amount of burning of crop waste. Um, and of course, in other parts of Madagascar, slash and burn uh, agriculture and all the smoke that's produced. And this occurs very close to the villages. The, when they're burning the, the crop waste, the village is filled with smoke. You can hardly breathe. Uh, of course, within the village, uh, as many of you know who go to Madagascar and other countries like it, there's a lot of burning of the garbage, right? And not just paper products, but a lot of plastic bottles, dead batteries, all sorts of things that are spewing toxins uh, into the air. Um, so these, these activities obviously have a lot of health consequences, um, but they also have a lot of environmental consequences, right? So all of that burning of wood requires that people go to the forest and collect wood and can result in deforestation. Right? The air quality affects our health, but it might also affect the, the health of, of animals, um, uh, including wildlife in the, the national parks and in these forest fragments. And um, of course, there's, there's also uh, the, the burning of all these products and their effects on climate change. I mean, especially black carbon, uh, which is one of the products of burning, for example, kerosene, um, that uh, has a huge impact on climate change. Now, over the last two or three years, I've been looking for projects that, I, that, that work in this intersection of human health and conservation. And I want to talk about one of those uh, projects today. Um, here's my real title slide. Um, and this title is the same title you saw before, um, but it has a lot more co-authors on it, as you can see. Um, this is a uh, project funded by Bass Connections. That's where our direct funding comes from, as well as Duke Global Health. Um, and Bass Connections uh, has uh, supported us directly now for two years, one year on this project, one year on another project. Um, for those of you who don't know, Bass Connections is a uh, program here at Duke aimed at stimulating interdisciplinary research and getting students involved in that kind of interdisciplinary research. So a, a typical Bass team is gonna have a very interdisciplinary PI team, a team of PIs, um, and my project, we have Charlie Welch uh, from the Duke Lemur Center. We have Subrendu Padanayak from the uh, Nicholas School of the Environment. Uh, we have uh, Jerry Bloomfield, uh, who's a cardiologist in the School of Medicine. And uh, we have Melissa Manis, one of my uh, former students. Now, the other exciting thing about a Bass Connections team is it's a vertically integrated team of undergraduates, of graduate students, of research assistants, of postdocs. And so over these two uh, years that I've had BAS funding, we've now involved uh, eight undergraduates, um, two master's students, a PhD student, uh, three medical students, and a postdoc. And these students and, and postdocs come together and learn from one another, and it's been a really productive time. I'd recommend it to any of the Duke faculty or graduate students and postdocs, because you can also apply, as I understand it, with the newest round of funding uh, to think about BAS connections. Now, importantly, we also have tremendous indirect support from the Saba Conservation Initiative, uh, launched at the Duke Lemur Center, really aimed to promote conservation around Marajeji National Park uh, through um, increasing livelihoods of people living there, through education, through other activities. And they provide all of the crucial logistical support, which goes on throughout the year to set up these teams of undergraduates 
to come to Madagascar. So thanks, thanks very much, Anne, uh, for the support and for um, uh, Charlie, um, because I know that this is really costly, even though it's not direct funding. Okay, so um, I have to say also, you know, we're still uh, very much in the discovery phase with this. We've just returned. Um, we have a seminar this semester. We're going through uh, the data from last summer, and that's what I'm going to present to you today. I really hope there's going to be time for feedback and to get to talk to people afterwards um, as well. And I have to say I feel completely out of my element with this talk. I have no phylogenies, you know, no theoretical models. Um, but anyhow, it's going to be fun. It's been fun so far, and I hope it's going to keep being fun. Um, so here's where we do the research. You can see we're working in northeastern Madagascar, uh, where you see that, that red mark here. And we're working around Marajeji National Park, and specifically in the village of Mondena. Um, this is a village that's on the route to Marajeji as you come in from the, the park office over here. It's the last village as you're walking into the park. Um, here's a picture of sort of Main Street uh, in the village. Uh, you're not seeing any tractors, you're not seeing any cars. Uh, it's a village of about 2,500 people, okay? Another thing you see very prominently is the line here of where the national park is. And that deforestation that's going right up to the edge of this national park, of course, with some fragments of forest still around um, in those lower levels. We've had, over the last two years, over 300 participants in our various health studies and surveys that we've done. Um, and many of these have been uh, participants across the two years, and we actually want to develop a longitudinal sample uh, over 10 or even 20 years uh, of this population. And of course, we go in and we talk to the people. We find out what their health concerns are um, and have tailored projects around those health concerns that we've heard. Uh, over the last, actually, three or four years of going to this village. Here's a bird's eye view of the village. As I said, it's about 2,500 people. It's a very rural uh, community, uh, very few even uh, of the zebu, of the cattle, uh, no tractors, no kind of mechanized uh, machinery. Uh, you can see the, the homes uh, along here, uh, as well as the fields very close by. And then this is the entrance into the, the village, and this is the road up to the national park and about four kilometers up that road, you hit the National Park, okay? Now, we, um, when we first went there, we asked, could we camp in the soccer field, one of the most prominent landmarks? They quickly told us, no, that's not allowed. Um, very firmly, we should have known not to even ask that. Um, and instead, we have a, actually quite a nice camping site right down here where you see these blue uh, tarps. And so we're camping uh, in the village. Okay, so here's an outline of what I wanna talk about. Uh, I want to talk about how uh, traditional cooking affects air quality, um, what we know about how that's affecting human health in this village, uh, and then how it's affecting uh, deforestation again in this area. And then I'll propose some of the solutions that we're very actively uh, exploring. You know, and I should have said we have a lot of the members of the team here. I see some of you in the back. I don't know, could you guys wave or stand up or something? Melissa, yeah, so we've got a lot of the team um, here with us today. Um, thanks, Melissa Dean, for letting them come. Um, okay. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So here's some of the variation we've documented in cooking practices uh, in this village. You see the sort of standard three stone fire uh, with the pot on top of it and wood burning underneath it. Um, they also buy these kind of tripods uh, very cheaply, a couple thousand ariari that uh, serve as the stones, but you can put a pot on top of it. Um, we see various kinds of stoves that uh, you know, can be loaded up with charcoal. There's not much charcoal cooking actually in this village, um, not much availability of it. Um, and then also more efficient uh, cook stoves like this Ades uh, stove, a Swiss NGO that's promoting uh, cook stoves. Um, what we find is that people actually tend to have multiple ways to cook, uh, just like you have multiple burners on your you know, you're on your stove and an oven and a microwave, they have multiple ways that they're cooking and they are cooking things that need multiple burners as well. So we see quite a bit of variation among households, but also within a household, there's variation day to day in what they're using. Um, who does the cooking? Through our household surveys, um, we, we can sort of tell you what the typical primary cook in a household uh, is. Uh, she's typically a woman uh, married to the head of the household. 
Uh, she's around 39 years of age. That's the mean age of all the primary cooks in our study. Um, and I should have mentioned, we, we've randomly sampled households. So we've gone around last summer and sampled 25 households. We'll hopefully get another 25 uh, next year. So this is from random sampling of those households. We, we've, our, the, the average age of the cooks in these households is 39. Um, she's cooking typically with firewood, as I said, on a traditional stove or an open fire. Um, she's cooking outside or inside, and that's important for what I'll talk about later, um, but in a separate room from where they're sleeping and, and living, okay? Sometimes they're eating in the same room as the kitchen, okay? Um, and there's some sort of very simple uh, rudimentary ventilation in the cooking area. It might be a window, a uh, door, space between the roof and the wall, but there's not like a chimney that's pulling up all the smoke out of that cooking area. Okay, so they're very smoky uh, in, those, in those areas. You can sort of see that here. So first of all, measuring air quality. We've done this so far with just two methods. Uh, one that allows us to measure carbon monoxide uh, and another that allows us to measure particulate matter, especially we're looking at the small particles. Uh, these are ones that can penetrate deep into the lungs they can even, the smallest ones can even get into the bloodstream, uh, potentially uh, in, affecting other organs you know, throughout the body, potentially affecting heart disease, for example. Um, and so we use these last car monitors for carbon monoxide and these uh, UCB PATs, they're called. Um, these are just a modified smoke detector um, and they optically measure the particles in the air. And here's one of our Malagasy students who has a couple of these distributing them to a household. Now we'll put these in the cooking area. We'll put one in the cooking area. You can see that she has two of them. One of them will go in the cooking area. The other one will go in the, the area where they're sleeping. Okay. And we find, as you might expect, incredibly high levels of carbon monoxide um, around these cooking areas. Uh, this is just showing one, you know, commonly used kind of cutoff of 200 uh, parts per million. And you can see the pattern of cooking here associated with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, cooking at all three times. Each of these colors is a, a, a different household in our survey. Um, we, we see this same pattern, but below the threshold levels in the, li in the places where people are sleeping. And so this carbon monoxide is actually getting into the areas where people are living, including where they're sleeping. Now it's below the threshold, but you can see the exact same pattern of uh, car elevated levels around the times when they're cooking, during the meals, but just before and during the meals. Um, we see a little bit more variation throughout the day in the particulate matter, um, but again, very high levels uh, of particulate matter. Um, you can see different households are burning wood or allowing the wood to burn for longer periods of time and we're picking up a lot of this particulate matter really throughout the, live, throughout the day um, in these households. Now, one thing that's really interesting is when we looked at the um, particulate matter in the sleeping areas, we saw something very unexpected. Um, we saw, for example, in two households, this very high level of particulate matter right in you know, sort of late afternoon. Um, we also see very high levels at night um, in some of these households, some of the same ones and some different ones as well. And at first I thought this has to, there has to be something wrong here. Um, but then you know, we realized um, actually it's probably other sources of particulate matter um, that are being used, especially these kerosene lamps, very simple wick lamps that produce incredible amounts of particulate matter and a lot of this black carbon I mentioned earlier that's such a potent um, effector on, the, on, on climate. And I think this part, the, 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 this elevation we're seeing here is probably a generator. A few of the households do have generators or borrow generators from time to time, charge up batteries that they have in the house. And so we're looking probably at generators here and kerosene lamps, which we didn't expect. And we, did, you know, we don't have the corresponding data uh, you know, following the people throughout the day in each of these households to say for sure that that's what's going on. Okay, so the people of Mondana um, clearly experienced very poor air quality. Um, it seems like a lot of this is related to cooking practices, but additional factors are likely to be involved. Uh, for example, the kerosene lamps I just mentioned. And so then the question is, is this affecting human health, right? 
So we've, for the health measures, we focused on two so far. We're hoping to add more to our, um, to our portfolio uh, in this coming summer. But I'll talk today about spirometry uh, and blood pressure. So spirometry is a way to measure lung, uh, lung health, lung volume, okay? And blood pressure, of course, you all know uh, from your own experiences. But anyhow, spirometry is a way to measure lung health by asking people to blow in this device, and it gives you all kinds of information about their lung capacity. So what we know from the spirometry results is that 93% of our sample is under predicted healthy values. 26% um, of our subjects' lung capacity is below what's called the lower limit of normal. Okay, so another kind of measure we can use. Um, of those that are below this lower level of normal, about 65% are women, um, as you would expect, because they're doing most of the cooking. Uh, we, do not have, we don't currently have IRB permission to study people under 18, so we don't know how the children are affected, but that's something we're certainly interested in. And overall, based on all of these different kinds of measures you can get, we estimate that one out of five people have impaired lung function in this village. <clears throat> so of course the question is, does the cooking itself somehow affect lung function? And we have some indications that it does. If we look at people who have are labeled as having, these are women, by the way, in this case, <clears throat> who are labeled as impaired in their lung function, they're more likely to cook inside than outside. Okay, now, we think a lot of other factors are at play here in, you know, in terms of what's causing impaired lung function. This result, you know, this is not a significant difference you're seeing here, but these are the kinds of things we want to follow up with, okay? Now, uh, moving on to blood pressure, uh, we were really surprised in 2015 to find that about one in three people in this population have hypertension. Um, not prehypertension, but actual hypertension. Um, we, you know, at that time we allowed people to come to us and we thought, well, maybe there's some sampling biases. Uh, we also just took one reading from each person and we thought, well, maybe there's a white coat effect and they're anxious about this procedure. And so this year, we, as I said, we went around randomly to households and we found exactly the same thing. 34.3% of this population living a very traditional lifestyle, very active people have hypertension. Uh, very surprising. So again, we've looked at whether hy this hypertension could be caused partially or driven partially by cooking practices. And again, we find that individuals who are cooking inside um, this is uh, 33 women, as was the previous plot, 33 women in the, um, I'm sorry, 33, p this would be women uh, in this case. Um, those cooking inside have higher systolic blood pressure. That's the first measure when you go to the doctor, right? Systolic over diastolic. Okay, so what about deforestation? Again, that's a crucial part of what we're interested in here. Um, the area where we're working is around Marajegi National Park. It's absolutely stunning. Who here has been to Marajegi? We have not enough of you. It's incredible. It's a really beautiful place. I'd highly recommend it. Um, we, there's wonderful facilities within the park, beautiful rainforest. As was mentioned the other day, I think by Marina, you can see all sorts of different ecosystems as you climb up into these mountains, um, including these kind of cloud forests and open kind of savannas where it looks like something out of Dr. Seuss with all these crazy plants. Um, here's James, one of uh, our, uh, one of the, former students on the project, now a research assistant in my lab and our Malagasy student. Um, and you can also see the deforestation around this national park very prominently um, and the remnants of forest, um, which there are quite a few remnants, but you know, we, ex we suspect they're going rapidly. Of course, a major uh, factor in this deforestation and getting right up to that park boundary is bringing in firewood. Of course, they're bringing in wood for other purposes as well. Um, but firewood's a big part of it. Um, and so last summer we went out and observed people collecting wood. Um, so you know, on the left you're seeing one of uh, the subjects in our study, a 68-year-old man, goes out and collects firewood two times a day. On this particular um, uh, day he carried 14 kilos of wood back two kilometers, okay? We also go out and of course weigh how much wood they're collecting. And then we also go around in the village and actual, actually weigh the seasoned wood, the dry wood um, that they're using and quantify how much they would use for cooking breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, okay? And I should say this project's led by uh, Lydia Green, this part of the project. 
and, but we're all participating in you know, all elements of the different projects. And so what we see is that they're using less wood uh, for breakfast than for lunch or dinner. They're cooking you know, less food, basically, or cooking for, le uh, for a shorter period of time. And based on the calculations that Lydia's done, uh, an average family is uh, using 3,200 kilograms of seasoned wood per year. Now, of course, it's a lot more that's ex extracted in terms of weight and in terms of all the you know, other plant parts, the leaves and everything else that's actually uh, taken down uh, when they're collecting the wood. Okay, so what about solutions? Um, we've been really, this is the most active area now for our group is trying to figure out the solutions. Um, you know, one, one thing, of course, we've talked about is better ventilation, getting more people to cook outside. You know, often it's just sort of a, a lean-to kind of a thing where there's a cover, but there's a lot more ventilation in that kind of a setting, right? And so we want to study that more and how that affects air quality. Um, better cook stoves, that's what we initially thought we wanted to do in this population, is introduce more efficient cook stoves. Um, and here are just some examples of what we think are more efficient cook stoves. But major questions arose as we got to know this population. Um, you know, one is, will people actually use them? You know, we saw a lot, uh, several of these sitting around in the village, mostly unused. Um, you know, some of these, especially the Ades. Um, how often would they use them, given they have different purposes for different stoves? So, you know, for example, maybe it takes longer to cook with these stoves. We've heard reports of that, but we want to actually measure that. They take longer to heat up, for example, with all the mass that they have in them, for example. Um, how much do they actually reduce wood consumption? If you introduce these, how much would it actually reduce wood consumption? We need to actually measure that uh, scientifically, quantitatively. How much do they improve air quality? Again, we need to really measure that. Um, there are other sort of more radical uh, ideas we're floating around, like uh, this, the Wonder Bag. Some of you have probably heard about it, and I'll thank Christine Dre, wherever she is, for reminding me about it. Um, this is a way to, to basically partially cook food and then place it in this bag, right, and have it continue to cook in the bag. And this, we think, might be useful for rice or other things that they're cooking that, that would then free up that burner to cook the vegetables, the meat, whatever it might be. And so it could really reduce the amount of wood used uh, in the village, but would they adopt it? Would people be willing to do this? Uh, that's gonna take more research. Um, you know, one other idea is to just trade out these awful kerosene lamps. You know, and think about when they're using these lamps, they're probably doing close work at night and getting huge amounts of uh, the pollution from these lamps very directly um, into their lungs. Could we trade those out for some of the solar lights that are out, you know, give people two or three solar lights if they'll turn in one of these simple lights, okay? Um, another idea, of course, is to keep children and pregnant women away from the cooking smoke um, or encourage them to not play with fire like we see kids, you know, pretending to cook things, uh, as you see here. Um, we're not sure what our solutions are going to be. As I said, we're still in the discovery phase, um, but we're heading back in 2017. Uh, we're really excited about it. The, the three Duke undergraduates who were out there last year all want to come back uh, with us, and I suspect, I hope, uh, some other members of the team will come as well. Um, and we really want to get to know this village and understand their behavior um, and their choices, why they're doing what they're doing, and how we can implement new solutions, and ideally solutions that also benefit that benefit both their health and conservation in the area. Um, so I want to thank again the, the, uh, so, uh, the, the Sava uh, Conservation Initiative, uh, Charlie, uh, Anne, for you know, all the incredible logistical support we've had, uh, Lantu and Marina for you know, really a lot of time and effort uh, to get our projects going, to do all the translations we needed done, to organize all of that. Uh, of course, Duke Vast Connections for the direct funding, uh, as well as Duke Global Health Institute. Um, pictures from DDC who came out and filmed us uh, last, uh, last summer. Um, the students who've just been incredible, I'm so proud of them. I should have said at the beginning, all of the data slides you saw, those students produced uh, this semester, just in this first month of the semester. So they organized the work, collected the data, did initial analyses, produced all those figures, and then sent them to me and I put them into the talk. Uh, so I'm really proud of them. And of course, I want to um, thank uh, the students, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, people who live in Mondana, who've given us incredible amounts of time uh, to answer all of our surveys and put up with all of our devices in their homes. So thanks very much. <laughs>